As you probably know, October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And to celebrate, InfoSec is giving away a free month of its InfoSec skills platform. This is a subscription-based skills training platform for cybersecurity experts. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, please go to infosecinstitute.com slash podcast. And don't forget to claim your free offer before October 31st. Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, I sit down with a different industry thought leader, and we discuss the latest cybersecurity trends, how those trends are affecting the work of InfoSec professionals, while offering tips for those trying to break in or move up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Our guest for today, Gary Berman, lived through something most of us wouldn't hope to experience in our worst nightmares. Through a combination of insider sabotage and collusion, Gary's company was hacked, duplicated, his clients funneled off to an identical rival company, and his bank account drained over the course of a decade. Fortunately for us, Gary moved from a victim to an advocate role, connecting with cybersecurity experts and leaders from across the vast field. He's now the creator of the graphic novel, The Cyber Hero Adventures, Defenders of the Digital Universe, a series of graphic novels aimed at teaching cybersecurity awareness and moving its readers from passive fear to positive activity. We're going to talk today about Gary's journey down, his return to the light after a multifaceted attack, and his work for security advocacy across various infrastructure fields, and uh, he's going to give us his tips to help keep you safe. Gary, thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. Uh, so let's start right back as far into the beginning as we can. Um, what was the name of your company, and what did it produce? When did it start? Can you tell me a little bit about the, sort of the glory years before we get to the gory years? Sure. Uh, my better half, Valerie, and I started a marketing communications and market research company in 1988. Uh, we were very fortunate just having started right out of our, uh, our, our home to be able to build it to uh, just about 100 employees um, after uh, about 10 years. Um, things were going incredibly well. Uh, because we were on the leading edge in terms of demographic uh, communications and market segmentation and other communication uh, protocols like that. So uh, we were able to sell 49% of our company, uh, which was called Market Segment Research, um, to the uh, one of the largest marketing companies uh, in the entire world, uh, called the WPP Group, uh, based out of uh, London. Um, oftentimes when there is a merger or an acquisition or a strategic alliance, expectations are incredibly high but are seldom really realized. Well, in our case, we had kind of conservative expo uh, expectations and it went through the roof. Wow. I mean, uh, we had a, about a 400% increase in sales in, in the span of about 30 days. Hmm. Um, and some of that is because of our relatively small size. And here we were essentially just, you know, picking up the scraps from this giant conglomerate, you know, who may not want to work on certain smaller projects. But for us, it was huge. Okay. So, you know, every so you day. Were, you were able to be, to, to sort of get so much market space by being sort of metaphorically the small fish in the big pond that could kind of sweep up the smaller targets. Is that more or less. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. It's a good metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and for me, in particular, I was very lucky because um, at the time I connected with uh, the, the uh, owner of the whole company and I was able through just kind of uh, using uh, that connection to be able to interact with uh, C-level people. Uh, throughout all these operating companies, uh, because I was, you know, rather than saying, hi, I'm Gary Berman, you know, from Market Segment Research, and of course, you know, they would never pick up the phone. I said, oh, hi, the CEO, you know, WPP suggested that I give you a call, and all of a sudden, right. doors open. Getting, you know, calls right back, oh, Gary Berman. And, you know, so that was the beginning of my kind of foray into C the C suite. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, since then, uh, I've spent a, a lot of time and effort and listened and learned uh, to uh, sea level people across uh, all sectors of the economy. And, and I came to understand what they care about, how they use their resources, uh, the stresses that sea level people are under uh, for all the competing uh, interests for their time and resources and things like that. So things were going great. Uh, then, uh, unfortunately, I was uh, playing basketball 
um, uh, ironically, in a, a Jewish uh, basketball league, which is somewhat of a, an oxymoron. Okay. Um, but uh, and I can say that because I'm Jewish, you know, right? Right. Um, and I and I broke my leg, so not a big deal. Typically, people you know have those injuries all the time, and so I went uh, to get it uh, fixed up. And to make a, a very long story short, I almost died from uh, blood clots mm -hmm. and some other complications. So those complications uh, were the predicate for the series of crimes uh, that began at that time. Wow. Um, so to go back a little further, what was your background prior to founding Market Segmentation, the company? Uh, had you always wanted to be an entrepreneur or was this something that just sort of uh, was an opportunity that you, you, you grabbed onto? You know, I uh, started at uh, seven years of age. Uh, I had uh, business cards printed up that uh, said Gary Lee Berman Lawn Barber. Oh, <laughs> right. So from an early age, you know, yeah. I was taking, you know, uh, with a push mower, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, before all the, you know, gas and all that stuff. Right, and, sure. And I was rebranding the experience as a lawn barber, thinking, wow, you know, people get haircut, so why not get their lawn cut? And, uh, and uh, I had a whole series of things like that very young. I, I worked uh, in the public library system at a particular library, and um, I always saw it uh, that uh, the Dewey Decimal System was incredibly complicated to try to follow. So I was, I, I, one of the things I did was I returned books to shelves, you know, after people uh, brought back books. And so uh, I invented my own system, you know, yeah. in the library. And, and of course uh, I could find the books, but no one else could. Um, so I got fired. Um, that experience really taught me um, that I really didn't want to work for uh, anyone else or any kind right. of bureaucracy because I was thinking, wow, you know, this is pretty cool. Uh, here's a whole new way of doing it. Why don't we try it? That kind of yeah. thing. And that's been really, you know, my ethos and maybe even my DNA, uh, you know, uh, ever since. I've always been incredibly entrepreneurial. Yeah, you've been a builder and, and sort of uh, sort of a builder of systems for a long time, it sounds like. Well, you know, it's interesting. It's, uh, I've always, I've got this thing from my mom, you know, this value system of elevating people. Um, so a slightly different way of saying it, Chris, you know, rather than a builder of systems, it was really more a builder of people, you know, and to seek out the good qualities, you know, in people while trying to help refine those things that, that any particular person would need. And I am the beneficiary of that in the cybersecurity ecosystem, right. you know, to, to an incredible degree, which I guess we'll get to in a little while. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, let's go back to the, the complications from the broken leg. You said that, that, that those complications were sort of the, uh, uh, shall we say the stress point that, uh, that started this whole thing. So what, what happened next? Well, you know, uh, as part of it, the reason I even am sitting here talking to you was just somewhat of a miracle because um, I uh, was, uh, prior to surgery for this, I let this physical therapist know that, you know, I felt this burning in my leg and it felt different. And she just said, well, it's just part of, you know, a complicated injury. I said, okay. So one day at about... Uh, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, my phone rang, which, you know, you never want your phone to ring at 2.30 yeah. or 3 in the morning. Um, so I popped out of bed, you know, my heart was pumping, and here's my physical therapist on the phone, and she said, Mr. Berman, um, I just had a dream about you. And I went, what? She said, you need to go to this place, you know, now. And I went, what? You know, and, 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 and I hung up. So I went back to sleep. And a few hours later, you know, I was nervous from what she had said, and I decided yeah. to go. And it turns out it was a cardiovascular institute. Hmm. And so I got there, and it was already really crowded in the waiting room. And I'm thinking, oh, great, you know, I don't, I don't have an appointment. I'm going to be here for, you know, 10 hours. And as soon as I said, my name is Gary Berman, these doors just flew open, <laughs> and five people came and got me. So I thought one of two things. Um, either, uh, I was a VIP or I was in big trouble. Right. And right. She I called ahead for you or something, huh? Well, I knew I was not a VIP. <laughs> yeah. 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 So anyways, uh, uh, so they found out what it was and, you know, thank goodness I survived. So 
um, I was out of my own company for an extended period, you know, really okay. almost about nine months. And um, I had a trusted right-hand person and several other trusted people, including an outside tech contractor, who even 15 years ago, when this first began, this, this, this episode, uh, was an absolute expert at Unix um, and at Mac OS in particular. And uh, he's, he's kind of like a mad genius, you know, when it comes to uh, computers and, and, and systems. And he's very much ahead of his, of his time. Hmm. Uh, so much so that uh, they spoofed my website. Um, they redirected uh, phone calls so that if someone would call my office number, it was actually through another exchange, went to a shadow company. They had uh, literally set up uh, an identical company uh, with a different name, but um, told everyone that I was no longer in the business and mm -hmm. that, you know, we'll handle your uh, your work and my clients were very big important clients like AT&T and Best Buy and General Motors and Procter and & Gamble and and um, you know we had worked hard my wife and I you know started from nothing to 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 <coughs> earn reputation you know that we were so blessed to have and and so um, one day how I found out that there was something amiss was um, I got a phone call uh, from uh, the CEO of, of one of the uh, member companies that uh, we were working with as part of the acquisition. And she said to me, she screamed to me. She screamed at me, which is the first time it's ever happened in my career. Um, and she said, you know, Gary, what the F is going on in your company? Yeah. And I almost dropped the phone. And I said, what are you talking about? I had no idea. And she said, well, I just got a call from one of your people that there's rampant fraud within your data collection infrastructure and that you're under investigation by the FBI and that I should cease communications with you. And my jaw just dropped. Yeah. Are you kidding me? You were an award-winning firm, incredibly well-respected nationally, giant clients at the sea level, and all of a sudden I get this you know call completely out of the blue. So I uh, called an all-hands meeting and I explained what had happened, and right away we we did redundancies. You know, we redid some of the of the survey research that uh, might have been in question, and found everything to be completely validated to one hundred percent you know, from a quality uh, assurance perspective. And, and there was nothing. But even so, just to protect my reputation, I returned $185,000 to one of our clients just as a precaution. Right, yeah. And that was a tremendous amount of money for us. You know, yeah. uh, so this wasn't some like, oh, here you go. I mean, yeah. you know, this was bad. But I right. figure my reputation is worth it. I'm going to totally refund this right. particular client. And we redid the project and found it to be perfect uh, again. Nevertheless, that poison was planted in her ear. Well, then a second client, then a third, and then a fourth, and then a fifth. And it, I later learned, like layers of an onion, they had called all my clients saying that uh, we were under investigation and to cease communications. And... And um, I kept, uh, and there were, there were actually 19 attack vectors, which, you know, I, I'm sure we're going to talk about in a little bit. And yeah. so I kept the company uh, going for uh, several years um, and depleted all my savings. And, um, you know, I went a little crazy after we sold the company. I never had any money. And so we bought a really nice house, yeah. you know, and, mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, I had to sell it and, and uh, actually, in one of my presentations, I revealed something I never thought I would, but I showed a receipt from an ATM that showed that I literally had one penny to my name. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. So we paid back over a million dollars, you know, to other companies. We didn't have to, but we took the ethical route and, and uh, we lost everything. And it wasn't just us. If it was just us. You know, I, I could say fine, like a phoenix rising from the ashes. You know, be, being a victim, unfortunately, is not particularly interested in, in today's world because there's so many victims of everything. Yeah. But the key is, like, what do you do about it? And right. um, we'll, we'll probably talk about that, you know, also a little bit later. Yeah, so uh, this, obviously, the narrative is in and of itself 
pretty compelling and tragic, but I wanted to dig a little deeper into some of the hacking tricks and security workarounds that uh, these people actually use to gain access to your money and your files and your clients and so forth. So you mentioned a, a few things that they spoofed the website and that they set up sort of alternate sort of phone calls, but how did they sort of, what were all the sort of pieces of this sort of complex web? What did they, what did they do? Well, there's two parts. Um, so the, the initial uh, uh, crimes um, were, you know, according to the FBI, uh, economic crimes, you know, and because they did it for money. And then uh, also um, a crime of opportunity because I was out and out of, I just didn't uh, follow up on anything. Um, and, and so during that time, that it's all, it was also very early on. I mean, Facebook was just kind of invented. Uh, you, you know, people did not think about cybersecurity as part of like the, the zeitgeist, you know, of the yeah, world. So, like what years would this be roughly? Uh, that would have been like uh, from 2000 to about 2006. Okay. Um, and, and, but I kept it going and like drip, drip, drip was just bleeding out, you know, without me knowing it. Um, you know, and, and so, uh, after we closed uh, the company, I, I moved on to some other things. I've always been kind of passionate about, uh, causes. So I, I worked, uh, on some things for veterans. Uh, some, I was the executive director of, of a project called the Anthem Project to, um, help, uh, warriors returning from theater reintegrate back into civil society. And then my wife and I uh, started an education company for children after school called Grasp Learning. Um, and we did that for a while, but we really just um, were struggling. So about three years ago, and here's where I'm going to answer your question a little mm -hmm. more completely. About three years ago, as a way just to try to put food on the table, uh, my wife and I agreed that I would try to go back to the marketing communications world, which, you know, I had left at then now about uh, 10 years earlier and, and uh, to go back. And so I put a few feelers out and I was really blessed. You know, I was invited to be a keynote speaker at a big conference. And so uh, I did, I spoke at this conference and people came up to me like, where have you been? You know, Hey, can you work on this project? You know, and I collected like this big stack of business cards, you know, people coming up to me, you know, and, and, and so I came home, you know, that night, uh, this is about three years ago. And I told my wife and I, I had tears of gratitude in my eyes. I said, look, after 10 years, these people still remember our work and want to work with us and let's rebuild. Okay. It's fine. Let's get on with it. So that night, after no communications with any of the original people that, that committed these crimes, three of them looked at my LinkedIn profile on the same night that I gave my keynote speech. And then the next day, the hacks happened. Boom, 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 boom. Wow. And it started, it started with uh, just my LinkedIn account. Uh, where my number of connections was just cut in half, like just instantly. I later learned it was a, uh, a, a different URL. You know, I thought mm. I was logging into my LinkedIn account, but, but I wasn't. But, you know, who knows? You know, I'm just a regular guy. I'm not a technology right. guy or cybersecurity. And I just, yeah. uh, you know, thought, oh, okay. And, and I really just kind of blew that off. And then um, I, uh, over time, um, they, uh, uh, spoofed uh, Google two-factor authentication. Um, they spoofed GoDaddy user interface. Uh, they spoofed Norton VPN. You, you would think Norton is, you know, is pretty secure. Right. Well, these guys you know, spoofed uh, the VPN and used um, alternative keyboards uh, to actually uh, uh, write where otherwise there would be English you know, on a user interface of, of, a, of a VPN. Uh, as a, just a sense of humor or something like that. Um, and and uh, there were um, 36 people connected to my OnStar account, mm -hmm. uh, listening to conversations. Wow. Uh, and um, it goes on and on. There were actually 19 attack factors. So <laughs> I, I hired a cybersecurity firm, you know, um, and uh, it was going to be pretty expensive. It was going to be like $10,000 to do some, you know, initial forensics. And I said, you know, I explained my story and, and I said, look, I only have a thousand dollars and thank God, you know, these guys were great. They're help. They're, they're helpers in the world like mm -hmm. you and all of your listeners. And so, 
um, they helped me. And, but I, I got a three page summary report and it said in part that there was a 90% chance that I was a victim of a man in the middle attack. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that all my communications, you know, that, uh, went out, stopped somewhere and then decide whether or not they went out. Some of them, many of them were changed. I had a power presentation, Chris, to Coca-Cola. It was, it was, it was a, uh, a proposal. And on the last slide, you know, I wrote, thank you. And it was changed to, you know, F you. Oh my gosh. So, so let me ask you, you think I got Coke as a client? Yeah, probably not. Of course not. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it went on and on and on and on and it became something else. And, you know, um, yeah, see, sadism I, at this point is almost sounds like, yeah. It was nuts, you know, and, and, yeah. and no, and no one believed me, which is another whole interesting thing sure. about being a victim, you know, because, you know, I had amassed all this evidence, turned it over to the FBI. I had secret service in my home. Um, you know, so they, they tried or attempted and they turned my stuff over to the, um, the U S district attorney who declined to open a case due to lack of attribution. And that's when I said, okay, this is just nuts. And, you know, because I, I, you know, I was small and, and one of the many lessons I've learned is that, you know, law enforcement, God bless them. They do the best they can, but they are stretched when it comes to this topic. Yeah. You know, and so was, was sports, it more that they, they had never seen something like this before or they just see so much of it that they, they were just like, I can't, it can't be this or, or something. Yeah. You know, what a great uh, question. Um, you know, it's a little of both, Chris. Um, yeah. They, they, they do see so much. I mean, uh, of course uh, we, we all know that, you know, these days, um, right. but um, it was kind of hard to believe. You know, and so, um, so what I did after that is I decided to be my own forensics sort of person. And, mm-hmm. and I just listened and learned and tried to figure out stuff that I could. And I started taking photographs using my phones. I had five different phones that were attacked in, in different ways. Uh, mm-hmm. Several using Bluetooth vulnerabilities, several mm-hmm. using SIM, uh, SIM swapping, uh, some of them, uh, they did some social in- engineering. I, I had a Wi-Fi, and I have all this documented, by the way, mm-hmm. like by AT and T, by Samsung. You know, so this is not like some some Gary thing. You know, <laughs> right, right. Uh, and if I had to self-assess, I mean, for all of your listeners, um, you know, I would say that my you know accuracy rate is probably around eighty percent. You know, and about twenty percent of the stuff I experienced were false positives, you know, and, and sure you get paranoid after a while, obviously. Yeah. And like, How well, could you not? Well, paranoia is an unfounded fear. So right. no, I was not paranoid. I was hypervigilant. Yes. And those are two different things. Of course. Yeah. That's what I meant. Yeah. I mean, you were, like you said you were finding false positives where, because you had so many actual positives that you start seeing it everywhere. I imagine. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, and, and, and actually on that point, um, I actually was so interested in, in, in to, to benchmark my own experience for the, ultimately the, the good of others that I, I looked into the Carnegie Mellon Institute. They have a cert for insider threat uh, impacts. And they're, they, they documented uh, in this kind of eye chart, a PowerPoint chart with, with these six vertical columns on it, about 10 boxes, uh, the negative impacts on a business uh, from insider threats. And okay. 57, 57 known threats, according to Carnegie Mellon, Mellon, and I had 23 of them. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so they, but they were grouped, you know, into, you know, economic effects and, and uh, physical effects and psychological effects. And yeah. the psychological one for me was incredibly important. And this will be about the first time I'm ever saying this to anyone, but you know, a lot of people close to me thought that I was nuts. Right. You know, yeah. That, that what, what do you mean? You know, this, this, and this, and, and uh, they, it scared them because it yeah. was like, Swahili. you know, it's just uh, cybersecurity and, and everything that you and all your listeners do is, is foreign. It's another language to 99.9% yeah. of all people. Sure. You know, it, yeah. Like, like me. Right. You know, and, and so I, decided I had to learn something about this. And at 60 years of age, there's no way, you know, I was going to get my CISSP or, right. you know, uh, get credibility. I, I just was very self-aware about that. So I bought a book called mm-hmm. Cybersecurity for Dummies. Yep. 
Have you ever seen those yellow books like with the black oh, yeah. stripe? Yep. A little guy in them. Yeah. So I thought, okay, perfect. Cybersecurity for dummies. <laughs> and and yeah. I get the book. I'm, I'm all excited. And Chris, 10 pages in, <laughs> I was lost. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, so, <laughs> it's still a lot. <laughs> you know, I mean, well, I just use maybe a different part of my, my brain or something. Sure. You know? mm -hmm. um, and so rather than giving up, I found the author. And I, and I told him that, that, that 10 pages in, I was lost. And he just started laughing, mm -hmm. you know, like, like almost crying from laughter. And finally, I, you know, he caught his breath. And I said, why are you laughing so hard? And he said, well, it's not really for beginners. Yeah. Just, just the name of the series. Yeah. <laughs> why do you call it cybersecurity for dummies? Right, you know? right. And that's when I realized there had to be a better way. And and was the beginning of my big pivot from, from victim to, to advocate. Yes. Um, so, um, uh, so I looked through, you know, you, you said you did a PowerPoint presentation where you tell your story uh, and you showed off several hacking tricks that were used against you. And you mentioned them briefly, including hacking your phones and your LinkedIn account. Um, could you tell me more about some of those hacks, how they were so effective and undetectable, like how they got there? Because I mean, it seems like, I think part of the thing people probably when you said that they don't believe you or whatever, like when we think of like hacking attacks or phishing attacks, we think of, you know, just some punk who hit your email once or put a, you know, put a virus in there. But like, it's terrifying to think of 23 different attack vectors in sort of a coordinated attack against one person who's trying to rebuild their organization after being cleaned out, you know, seven years ago or whatever. So um, so could, I mean, obviously it's painful, but could you sort of tell me about the sort of the network of these things, how they, you know, they said that you said that they saw your presentation on LinkedIn and then immediately went to work that night. Like what did they, can you sort of retrace the steps of what they did to sort of build this cage? Sure. What an interesting word cage. Yeah. You know, I, I've never thought of that, but as you just said, it, it, it was in some respects. It yeah. Felt you, like, you sound like, surrounded. Yeah. I mean, it's it, everywhere well, you look, your phones, every mode of communication has got something on it. So, I mean, my, my, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll just start with what I was able to kind of uncover. Remember, okay. I'm not a, I'm not a forensics guy. I no, mean, you know, I, yeah, I, neither I, am I. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm not in law enforcement. I was just this right. regular marketing guy, you know? So with that as a, as a caveat, um, what I actually began to do was uh, I invited a, a bunch of CSOs, uh, chief security officers, to connect with me on LinkedIn mm -hmm. um, and um, just to listen and learn. And um, I did everything I could to try to understand, like, what could cause this, you know, like the, uh, the car, for example. You know, my, my GPS screen was wobbling and it was mm. a new car. Um, and, and so, um, I took it to the local car dealer where we bought it and I said, look, my GPS screen is wobbling and, um, they, uh, had me wait in the, uh, the, uh, sterile, uh, waiting room with terrible black coffee and mm -hmm. which I'm sure we've all been in and about a half hour goes by and the, the head service guy comes in to get me and he points his finger like this and he goes, uh, you know, like this, follow me. I went, okay. So I go and I follow him. We walk into the service bay with all the noise of, you know, rip, 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 and, and all that. Um, and he goes, go around in the passenger seat. I said, okay. It was, it, it was on a bay, but not, not in the air. So I get in the passenger seat and all of a sudden I hear a female voice and, and, the, and the service guy says, ma'am, can you please repeat what you just told me? And I'm like, what? You know, and all of a sudden I hear this voice. It was OnStar. Oh, yeah. And the operator in OnStar told me that lie, that there are 36 cars that, you know, attached to your account. I say, I only own one, you know, and, and what is it? And one thing led to another. So we got it documented by the, by the car dealership, exactly what had happened on their stationery that they, that this guy or whoever else found, or he figured out he, what you call OnStar, then um, they tried to do in a, a, a telemetry telemetry mm -hmm. um, of the car, you know, to uh, plug it into their devices, and it wouldn't acknowledge the the uh, the car mm -hmm. um, and things like that. So that's just one example of one kind of vector. 
Right. Um, you know, the, the other ones just came up because I tried to use things, you know, I, I thought, okay, great. You know, let me try, you know, multi-factor authentication, you know, on Google. So I switched from GoDaddy to Gmail and I thought I was doing it fine. And then, you know, I was getting text codes. And then I, one day I just uh, noticed that uh, the code was the same as the other one that I got. Cause I looked at you know, my phone and saw SMS, you know, the various texts. And then I looked further and they were all the exact same code, mm. you know, and I had learned that the way these things are supposed to work is, you know, these are single use tokens. And so right. each one should be unique and, it should come from a masked five digit number, you know, from SMS. I mean, I just learned about all that. Right. And I said, well, mine's not, you know, and then uh, like layers of an onion, I finally figured out that somehow at that time, you know, they had, they had spoofed Google two factor authentication, wow. you know, and, and the, so ask, I, I can't tell you any deeper. No, that, that. yeah, of course. That's fine. You know, but but I have learned, I've talked to a lot of cybersecurity people, they tell me how those things, you know, are done and all that and stuff. Right. So, you know, and then, um, I mean, I could go through another 16 if you want, but I'm not <laughs> sure your, your listeners uh, want to no. hear that. Um, so, I mean, and yeah, obviously the, the, the giveaway with the GPS was the, the, the wobbling, which I guess was, you know, just the, the sheer amount of sort of <laughs> interference that was going on within it. Um, so in your in your PowerPoint, you showed a bunch of examples where you saw you would have like what the um, VPN was supposed to look like. And then the one that they had where it, it didn't have the, the sort of toggle on the bottom and things like that. So like based on that, I guess, rather than point out every one of them, what were some of the sort of visual clues? Like one of them, your workstation had like a slightly different graphic in the background or something like that. Like what should people be looking for? You know, if they have a general feeling of something's wrong, but I don't know what, like, what are some things they should be looking for or who, who should they be going to? Well, I mean, that, that is just a huge question. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. We can you know, break it down. Um, but for me, I mean, I, I would just always go back to the basics, you know, basic cyber, cyber hygiene. So, you know, if, if, um, you know, by the way, since you, since you mentioned my, my presentation I, with your permission, I just want to go back one second. Sure. Because you, sure. Sure. You just caused me to think about something. So one of the things about being a victim is, is you're scared or you're ashamed or you don't really know exactly what it is, you know, mm -hmm. and things like that. So in my case, I never told anyone about any of this for all those years, mm -hmm. you know, that I had lost a multi-million dollar company. Sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. Until a, a, a little over a year ago, I was invited by Gartner to give a, a speech to their uh, security and risk management conference in Wa uh, National Harbor, Washington, uh, DC. And so in preparation for that talk, I thought, okay, what are the, this level of people who really know what they're looking at, you know, from a cybersecurity standpoint, you know, what, what can I show them that they can scrutinize and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I put together this particular visual PowerPoint because it just shows pictures and there are videos of, of, of I have videos of hacks actually happening like yeah. through my, my routers and things like that. So wow. I put together that PowerPoint deck and, you know, Chris, I've been a, a, a public speaker for, you know, 20 years and never get nervous. You know, mm -hmm. I'm really lucky that way. But before that speech, I was just shaking in my boots mm -hmm. because it was the first time I would have ever spoken publicly and not just that to people who really could shoot down everything that I showed. Mm -hmm. They could, they could look at it. They know yeah. what they're doing. Oh, yeah. These are yeah, cyber security yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they could, you know, I could go, Oh my God, you know, all this is, you know, raw. Um, anyways. So I did the presentation and not only, you know, uh, did I get, you know, sort of these rousing round of applause, a whole line of people came up in a line wanting to, to get autographs of, of my comics, which, you know, we'll talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. And, and Chris, I have to tell you just like this moment right now for me, how grateful I am because in you, in all of your listeners, I have found a home. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, you know, and so all I do now is I travel to all these cybersecurity conferences, you know, and, and uh, listen and learn and do what I can to help, uh, you know, people with the skill sets, you know, that I have. Um, 
and um, the story's not over. Yeah, uh, you in your, again in your PowerPoint, you 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 described yourself as the Forrest Gump of cybersecurity, and you had a a bunch of photos of sort of um, well-regarded people that you've sort of collaborated with or spoken with or you know, uh, spoke alongside or whatever. Could you, could you give us a, a list of some of the folks that you talked to about this case and, and your history? Yeah. Uh, Kirsten Nielsen, the former head of DHS, mm -hmm. um, Forrest Gump. I mean, in, uh, I'm doing a comic right now, uh, for a big consulting company. Um, uh, and we're going to, uh, I'm going to be traveling to Dubai to train 300 kids on cybersecurity. Mm, wow. You know, uh, and I'm thinking, like, what am I doing here? Uh, yeah. I'm going to be I'm going to be in, doing an interview uh, with uh, Gary uh, Kasparov, the world chess oh, yeah. master, right? Uh, because he's into cybersecurity now, and I got mm. connected to him. Okay, uh, those, those are just a couple current examples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I, yeah, let's 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 talk about it. one of your big projects at the moment. I, arguably, your biggest one. It's uh, it's right there behind you on the the screen is the creation of your comic book series entitled "The Cyberhero Adventures: Defenders of the Digital Universe." Uh, so, tell me about the comic. What's it about? Who's it aimed at? Uh, what was your impetus to create it? And, uh, and and so forth. What what what's it all about? Yeah, thanks for that question. Well, the genesis was actually um, from a psychological experience I went through as part of the hacks. You know, I went to see a marriage counselor, my wife and I did, uh, because, you know, this is devastating on a bunch sure. of levels. Yeah, yeah. And one of, the, one of the tools that he advised me to use was to start journaling, mm, you know, yeah. just sort of random thoughts of a cluttered mind, you know, and you just yep. write them down. So the approach I took was to uh, just uh, dictate, you know, voice memos and uh, just whatever was on my mind at any time. And it was very cathartic. Um, and so after, you know, a couple of months, I decided to have my voices, my voice memos transcribed. And I ended up having over 60,000 words. Mm -hmm. I later learned that you can do a novel at about 70,000 words. So I said, mm -hmm. okay, I'll start writing a book. And so I did. I started writing a book called Stalking on Air. Okay. And uh, the cover is super cool, um, you know, because it shows this uh, a, a Wi-Fi signal, but this 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 figure of a man, you know, just looking up and a shattered glass all around, right. you know, uh, this, this 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 character, which is was what I thought. So uh, I got maybe I don't know ha halfway through it, but writing a book is really hard, you know, and I I didn't have that skill. And so I had to find another way. And that's what kind of led me to uh, the cyber, uh, cybersecurity for dummies. Mm -hmm. And then when I realized that there had to be a better way, I had happened to see Spider-Man. Oh, yeah. And so that was the light bulb, you know, that went out. I said, superhero comics, right. you know, maybe there's a way to distill complicated technology information into something that, most people can get their heads around at least to, to amplify the need for, you know, cyber awareness, that kind of thing, you know, it's not a training protocol, you know, uh, by the way, I'm not a vendor. I'm, I don't sell anything. I haven't made a penny in three years. Although right, right now we, we just got a sponsor. I, so I want to give a shout out to uh, Aon, oh, uh, you know, the largest uh, insurance company in the world has yeah. agreed to sponsor our comics. So, which was a real uh, 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 nice surprise for us, but, Anyways, so um, I, I didn't know anything about comics. So I'm like the least qualified person. I, I, I knew nothing about the subject, you know, plus or minus cybersecurity and nothing about the modality, you know, of, of how right. to do, do comics or draw, you know. And other than that, I thought, okay, I'm perfect. Yeah. Um, so uh, I had to learn about comics. And mm -hmm. so uh, as it happens, I was up late one night and I saw the tail end of an announcement that there was a comic con uh in 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 south florida where i lived that morning the next morning mm -hmm. so i said okay i'll just go and check it out so i go and i put on my my sport coat uh you know white shirt khaki yep. pants and i pull into the parking lot and um you know i as soon as i get out maybe 15 seconds uh this woman comes up and she's dressed in green face with antenna and these giant <laughs> butterfly wings and she says sir I think you're a little overdressed. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I have a photograph of that. Um, 
you know, and, and that was an understatement. So have you ever been to a comic con? I haven't, but I have a lot of friends who, who work at them and display at them and dress up for them and so forth. Yeah. Oh, you have to go. I mean, yeah. it is, it, it expands your mind, mm -hmm. you know? And at first I, I was judgmental. I'm going like, what, you know, these people are spending so much time and effort into this. But then by the time I left, which was five hours later, I was only going to stay for 30 minutes. And I was so, you know, uh, into it that I realized, wow, look at the creativity, look at the storytelling, look at, look at the self-expression, the ability to um, have an alter ego, you know, and the, the ability to have fun and not take yourself too seriously, you know, and things like that. So I got bit by the comic bug. Um, and so I worked uh, at first uh, on a minimally viable sort of product, a, a cover of a comic, and it was actually called the, uh, the Cyber, the Adventures of Cyberman. Mm -hmm. And so for the next Comic Con I went to, I had this prototype cover on my t-shirt. Like I had a really big, big giant uh, cover of the comic. Right. And I went to this Comic Con because I, I thought I could listen and learn. So there was a, a line of people waiting for an autograph from a really cool guy from Marvel Comics uh, who worked right under Stan Lee and who was like one of their big ones. So I said, I'll just wait in line, you know, get an autograph. You know, that'd be fun. So I go up there and, and uh, I have my big shirt on my, with my, my cover. And I say, sir, can I ask you a question? And he goes, yeah. I said, what do you think about this cover? You know, the, the adventures of cyber, the Cyberman adventures. And he, and he looked at it and without even blinking, he said, I think you're going to get sued. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I said. What? Yeah. What do you mean? He says, well, have you ever heard of Doctor Who? And I said, who? No, I haven't. And it turns out it's this giant franchise that's yep. been around since for 50 years or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah, the Cyber have, yeah. Exactly. They have these characters called Cybermen and, you yep. know, and they even looked a little like one of my characters and I yep. never knew it. So I said, Oh man, you know, I'm going to kill that. And, um, so, um, I went to the, the community for help. I put, I put, uh, 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 that comic cover uh, on my LinkedIn page. Uh, and at that time I had maybe 500 contacts or so. You know, I never really used LinkedIn very much. Um, and um, I, I, I started inviting CSOs uh, to send me real life stories of blinded real life stories of cybercrime, answering the questions, you know, what happened? What were the consequences? And most importantly, what were the lessons learned? for possible inclusion into a comic book series. And I'm really just humbled to say that as of today, I have 21,950 connections yeah. of the most important people in the world in cybersecurity and IT, like you wouldn't believe it. And they just started helping me. And, and that's when I realized that this was actually not about me and that there was a mission here. And so my mission is to you know, because the only time you hear about cybersecurity or hacking is when the black hats win. Right. And so <clears throat> I decided to make my comic and, and my team's mission to shine the light on the unsung heroes who toil in anonymity day and night to keep us safe, you know, and to say thank you. And that's all I do starting at 4 a.m. every day. Okay, so walk me through like an issue of Cyberhero Adventures. Like, what what are the sort of stories like? What are the the characters like? What what would it, what what are we actually going to see? Is it is it told as sort of an adventure story, or is it told like how do you get the sort of how do you sort of combine the adventure and the knowledge uh, in in the in the same thing? Yeah, what a great question. And and we wrestled with this, right? I mean, sure. I, you know, we yeah. had this from nothing, so it took a long time. Um, but the first thing I did is anthropomorphize hacks. You know, I, right. I had to oh, okay. find some other way instead of a one and a zero to bring actual hacks to life. So as luck would have it, you know, the, the cybersecurity community, the IT community are into video games, they're into comics, they're into all that, you know. Sure. And so if you think of the names that people give to hacks are already comic names and things. Yeah. So my very first character that we cre created was Wilbur Wannacry. Oh yeah. Um, and so of course that's the one, but think of the name yep. Wannacry. So, oh, okay. Yep. I get that. So we yep. drew this sort of goofy looking bug, you know, with tears, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, created a backstory that if one of the tears touches you, 
Um, it's going to, you know, encrypt your computer. And then you have to make a decision about, you know, whether or not you pay ransom. And then if you're going to pay ransom, uh, you know, what guarantees you have that they're going to give you, you know, the de encryption key and yeah. I mean, these are criminals. So that's how we get into the story through the characters. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of our characters, uh, besides Wilbur, we have uh, Ivan, the identity thief. We have Boris, the bug. Um, which is interesting too, because these, these characters and everything evolve as we learn from the community. So for example, it used to be called Boris the Bugger. And then I got this uh, email from a guy in London who says, you might want to not call it Bugger because <laughs> at least in, in London and uh, One step ahead of you there. Yeah. <laughs> there has some sexual connotations, you know. Yeah. Um, so he changes to Boris the Bug. Yeah. You know, uh, but but on a more serious note, one, my my at first my biggest villain was Queen Queen uh, Mallory, like Mallor malware. Oh you know, yeah, Queen sure. Mallory. And she was the the head of all the, these these villains, you know, the, the the creatures and stuff. And so we printed about seven hundred copies. We distributed it at, at a conference uh, in New York, and um, very quickly, uh, several different women in different settings after they looked at the comic, they said, "Let me ask you a question." Um, are you aware that uh, we're trying to recruit more women into cybersecurity? Yeah. And they went, yeah, sure. I, you know, I've heard a lot about that and, and, and uh, diversity and, and uh, all that. So then why do you have your lead character be a villain? Mm -hmm. Yep. And I, and I said, wow, that's a good point. So yeah. in the subsequent edition, we changed it from Queen Mallory using the same art. We changed the backstory to Queen Geo, and oh, yeah. Geo stand, stands for a real person. Her name is, is Jennifer, Jennifer Sunshine from IO Active. So we took the first letter for her first name, you know, J and IO Active, we called her Queen Geo, mm -hmm. you know, and that part of her mission is to empower young people to take STEM courses, especially young girls, and to encourage young women to pursue careers in cybersecurity and, you know, and, and things like that. Half my characters are Hispanic or African American or Asian. Uh, we have a veteran, you know, so I, I've listened and learned about, you know, the benefits of more diverse people and views yep. within the within the community. So we took that to heart. And so um, so we so we have uh, 16 characters, you know, about eight of them are the are the villains and about eight of them are heroes. The the heroes are all real people. OK. And 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 for different reasons we put them in we put a cia agent in there she was had amazing stories um in the we're going to be uh by the way um i'm glad to uh, give all your readers the powerpoint you know that okay. you're talking about. you can make that available if you want if they think okay. it would help we them might you well know. you know put a link to it or something in the, in the YouTube here. So yeah, if it can help them, they're, they're glad or they can see for themselves, you know, some of yep. what we're talking about and stuff like that. So, so the, um, the, the, we're releasing a new edition uh, for uh, cybersecurity awareness month, you know, yep. starting next week and it's called follow the money. And the reason it's called follow the money is from a content and edi editorial standpoint, you know, now that we've anthropomorphized the, the uh, the hacks and then we have real life heroes depicted. You know what are the stories, which is you know another part of your question. Um, I I get them from real people. So what I'm about to tell you came from a senior person at the Department of Treasury, um, who's in charge, uh, amongst other things, of cybersecurity and stuff like that. And and so um, this particular story um, actually involved uh, a contest. Um, where uh, the winners received uh, what we call a Siri Lexi. We just combined the name Siri and Alexa into a digital home device called the Siri Lexi. Mm -hmm. And they're going, wow, this is great. You know, and then, oh, yeah. so the way we teach is we have a drone fly in, you know, about the, the Siri Lexi saying, remember, they're always listening. So be cautious about what you say. Right. So that's the way that we impart, you know, just a, a very basic thing to the reader so they start becoming a little bit safer. So in that issue, we use drones to fly in with different uh, uh, it, it, uh, bits of advice. Don't, don't click on the link, you know, don't open, you know, basic cyber hygiene. Yep. You know, it, since that causes most of the hacks anyways, it seems. So that's uh, really all we're capable of, you know, focusing on. So, 
uh, the drones come in in the in the uh, uh, in the. So just to finish that story, so what happened was they won this they won this device. Oh, everything's great. Then they found out they won a first class trip to. Uh, it happened to be Australia, but in the comic we called it Web Surfer Paradise, mm -hmm. uh, and. And uh, so it was first class, uh, and this really happened. So a limousine picks them up, another, you know, cars following them, take their luggage, their champagne, go to the airport, fly first class all the way to Australia, all free. And they were very skeptical, like, oh, you know, we have to give our credit card. It was nothing. Right. And so they go and they have this amazing, you know, time. And so a week goes by, they come back, and, and uh, they're coming back from the airport where they landed, and all of a sudden, woo, 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 woo you know, sirens and helicopters flying over. And then these guys, they get pulled over on a highway and there's these guys in hazmat suits, white hazmat suits from head to low. You know, man, they step out of the car and they're going, like, what? you know, they're freaking out. And so they go and they get out of the car and it's surrounded by police. They have guns, they have hazmat, you know, they, they, they put them in handcuffs. Uh, and uh, then they, uh, they uh, crack open the trunk. They, they break into the trunk of the second vehicle and they have a Geiger counter, and all of a sudden you're, you know, the clicking of a Geiger counter and a piece of luggage, you know, it was insane. And, and they take it out, and it turns out that in these telescopic handles, they were smuggling in enriched uranium hmm. inside the handles. Wow. And they were, they were mules. Yeah. Unbeknownst to them. Yeah, yeah. So the, the next part of that, I have a, C, a real CIA agent explain mules. And she says, you know, if we think about mules, um, you know, let's think about motivations. Why do criminals do this? Well, the number one reason is usually money, you know, but there are other reasons, but it's usually money. Um, and so he said, Let, let's go back to like the gold rush. So I take the reader back to 1849 because it turns out there are a lot of parallels between then and now. Like then they mined for gold. Now we mine for data. Right. You know, um, there were black hats and white hats in, in cowboy movies as a way to distinguish sure. from bad. Yeah. Uh, in this industry now, we say, are they in the wild, you know, or in, in kind of the wild west? You know, there's a certain level of lawlessness and, and, and stuff like that. And, and so we take the reader into understanding how to stay safe through those kinds of stories. So in, in, in the learning industry, that, this is called disguised learning. Right. Now, so if, uh, if people want us to read these issues, I can sort of see the website back there, but where, where should they go to, to get an issue or, or read them online or get PDFs or print copies or whatever, whatever they want? Sure. I, I would appreciate that. And if they like it, share it with people. Um, they can go to cyber heroes with an S comics with an S dot com. And uh, there's uh, digital e-readers there. You can download them yourself. So you can have PDFs and, and uh, like I said, there's uh, no cost uh, for any of that. We're working on our first animations now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to bring to bring the, the comics to life. And and one editorial thing I just want to make sure that that I that I impart with you is from a content standpoint, we're uh, creating 16 quarterly issues focused okay. focused on the DHS critical infrastructure sectors. Mm -hmm. And so you know, our next four editions, well, we're releasing Follow the Money in the next week or so. Uh, then we're going to be doing uh, healthcare uh, because mm -hmm. it's so incredibly vulnerable to hacks and oh, yeah. you know, uh, personal health information and, and digital medical devices and IoT devices. I mean, that industry is just, you know, vulnerable. Uh, I'm sure all your listeners know that. And then, oh, yeah. then we're going to do IT, then we're going to do telecommunications and then automotive over the next uh, four years. So those are the subject matters that we operate around. Okay. Uh, and, and we seek stories for, for those. So, and I would love for people to connect with me on LinkedIn. You know, okay. I, I, I post, um, I post stuff that makes you tilt your head, you know, like sort of, I had a dog and, and you go like, huh, that, right. that's, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm trying to tap into sort of this inner child that yeah. all of us have. Mm -hmm. All right. So, By the way, so I, who's your, uh, who is your favorite superhero? Can I ask? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, that's a very good question. Um, I would say, boy, that is a very good question. I would probably go with, uh, uh, I'm not a huge superhero guy, I guess the incredible Hulk maybe. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's got, he's, he's got a lot of complexity around him. You know, he's got the, <laughs> 
he's had some ups and downs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? It's funny. Not funny. It's very intuitive that you said that because, you know, one of the things I had, I tried to model our work after is Marvel, mm, you know, mm -hmm. and Stan Lee, you know, may he rest in peace. Uh, they had this thing called the Marvel way. And there were these six principles, you know, and, and, and essentially, you know, to, to paraphrase, uh, being vulnerable is incredibly right. important because nobody is born a superhero. Right. I'm talking about like real life. We're all just babies, right. you know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, then life happens, you know? Yeah. Um, so I hope that we all have superheroes in it, in us. And I would like to ignite the, that child passion again in, in this industry. All right. Well, and on that note, Gary, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks to all your listeners for being unsung heroes. All right. And thank you all. Uh, as he says, thank you all for listening and watching. Uh, if you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more of them on our YouTube page. Just go to youtube.com and type in cyber work with InfoSec. Check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Just search cyber work with InfoSec in your podcast catcher of choice. Uh, and as Gary mentioned, in honor of National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, InfoSec is offering a free month of its InfoSec Skills subscription-based learning platform to listeners of this podcast. Just go to infosecinstitute.com slash podcast and click the learn more link uh, to learn more about it. And be sure to claim your free month before October 31st. Then it goes away. Uh, thanks once again to Gary Berman and thank you all for watching and listening. We will speak to you next week.